Thursday afternoon. My name is Asha George, and I'm very happy to introduce today's speaker. Um, we at the School of Public Health at the University of the Western Cape are very delighted um, to host this year's annual David Saunders Lecture in Public Health and Social Justice. I'd like to acknowledge Professor Saunders, after whom this lecture is named, um, our dear guest, Professor Hussein Mohammed Jerry Kabadia, who's agreed to give us the lecture this year, our acting dean, faculty of Community Health Sciences, and all of our fellow students and colleagues, uh, the students who've been here as part of winter school, and our colleagues that have come from the School of Public Health, other parts of the university, and other parts of the broader community here in the Western Cape. Not everyone could make it, so we have some apologies and best wishes from certain very key individuals. So Professor Jose Franz, our DVC of Research and Innovation, and our acting rector couldn't make it. She conveyed her apologies. She's meeting with a Norwegian delegation. Members of the executive, including Mr. Regal, the Director of Finance, and Ms. Patricia Lawrence, our Director of Institutional Advancement. So just a few words about the lecture. The, the series honors uh, Professor David Saunders' legacy as the founder of our School of Public Health and recognizes his considerable contributions to the University of the Western Cape, the field of public health, both locally and internationally. And I have the <coughs> honor of having joined the School of Public Health just a year ago. But wherever I go, even before coming here, when I mentioned UWC and the School of Public Health, people almost immediately say, are you working with David? <laughs> so he's very well known amongst many different layers of activists, policy makers, researchers around the world. And this includes, he's known the world over, but he was also formally recognized um, by the University of Cape Town, who awarded David an honorary doctorate. As part of recognizing his legacy, um, and it's odd talking about his legacy, because David is well and alive, keeping us all on our toes. <laughs> here at the School of Public Health. But one way of, of part of that legacy is every year we have an eminent speaker who's invited to engage our community, our community of scholars, practitioners, policy makers, activists, the whole breadth of who, who should be part of our community to address the contemporary challenges and opportunities for public health research, teaching and practice really bringing scientific excellence and the implications for political and social action to bear on their issue. To really bring in, while our focus is on public health, the underlying how can we raise the game in understanding the political and social basis for public health. And that is all, it speaks to how David has constructed and laid the foundations of our School of Public Health. As the title implies, Public Health and Social Justice, the, the lecture is also a celebration and a commitment to a set of values. So the values we hold very dearly here in terms of equity, social justice, international solidarity that are at the center of our identity as a school. We've had, this will be our fifth speaker, We've had speakers, um, Professor David Saunders, who had the inaugural lecture in 2012, followed by Professor Shula Marx, who really spoke about contesting healthcare, looking at the history of healthcare in South Africa from 1930 to 2013. Professor Richard Lang, who talked about access to medicines. Several of you may remember in 2015, Dr. Mary Bassett, who really spoke about, came from the US and talked about Black Lives Matter in the US and the issues, the social crisis that's been happening there and the challenges for medical and public health. So while far away, very relevant to today in this context. 
And similarly, last year we had a speaker from India, Professor Sundaraman, really looking at how do we strengthen public health systems. So this is at the heart of bringing people to the School of Public Health from abroad as well as locally to address these issues. And we're very lucky that Professor Hussain Mohammed Jerry Kovadia has agreed to speak. He has a title here, Mind the Gap, Embracing Fairness, Eliminating Inequities in Health. And that's been at the heart of some of the issues that we care about, but even in the last week, reflecting on course participants as they've looked at the gap between policies, what's said in policies, what happens in practice, um, not only from the very top, but also in terms of what happens in health services. How do we influence provider behavior, and how do we work with communities to support social change? So I think we're really delighted to have you here join us to, to give us your perspective and experience on this very important topic. I'd like at this point to hand over to our acting dean, Professor Roda, who will give us the welcome address. Good evening, everyone. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you all our honored guest, both internationally and national, to the annual David Saunders Lecturing Public Health and Social Justice. A special word of welcome to our guest of honor, our speaker, Professor Kavadia, who will be addressing us this evening on important topics relating to fairness, equity, equality, contextualizing it somewhat in the public-private dichotomy. To improve access to health, for all South Africans, the public health sector was restructured in 1994. Although gains were made in terms of access and rationalization of health management, many individuals who have no choice but to access and use the public health sector faced many challenges when using the service. I must add that practitioners were also often challenged when providing services in the public health sector. For the service users, these challenges included having to queue as early as 4 o'clock in the morning to avoid long queues to get to see health practitioners and not receiving required services they needed. For those of us who have worked in the public sector, specifically, specifically at primary care level, we often experience a sense of maybe loss or disempowerment when we could not provide the services that our clients or our patients needed. Primary level care services were often not sufficiently supported by secondary and tertiary level care. And so patients often had to wait a year or six months to see a specialist, something that doesn't happen when you are able to access the private sector. Individuals needing devices to improve functioning, for example, were not provided with these due to a lack of availability. It's important to note that the individuals who use the public health sector are often your vulnerable groups. You're poor, you're disabled, and you're aged. It's more than 20 years post-1994, and we're still striving to implement mechanisms to improve equity in the provision of healthcare services. Hence the mention of this in the executive summary of the white paper of the NHI. NHI. It is therefore important that we continue to reflect on the aspects of fairness, equality, and equity. Prof. Hussain, we are honored to have you here this evening. Once again, welcome. And I'm sure that after your lecture this evening, we would be able to apply the information you're going to share with us, not only in practice and engagement, but in teaching and research as well. I thank you. I'm also MC, so now, thank you so much, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Rhoda, and I'd like to now hand over to Professor David Saunders to introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, uh, Asha, and for your kind words, especially about my legacy. I mean, I'm not dead yet. <laughs> 
<laughs> my late mother used to say, and it's kind of pertinent today, um, they say such nice things about you at your funeral, it's a pity I'm going to miss mine by just a few days. <laughs> So, um, it's wonderful to have Jerry Kavadia here, and before I formally introduce him and speak a little bit about him, I just want to recall uh, our first meeting, <clears throat> which was in Zimbabwe in 1981, when I invited him, Professor Luning, another colleague from Durban, Professor Marian Jacobs, and a few others from South Africa, to a conference which I organized on community child health, and that was when we made our first <coughs> acquaintance. I can remember all of us sitting on the floor in a room in my house. We didn't have enough chairs, I think, for all the people that were there. And it was wonderful to meet him, and I later uh, stayed at his house in the mid-1980s when I, I think I was invited to speak at a medical students conference um, at the University of Natal, as it was called at that time. And his lovely wife, who isn't here tonight, uh, took me to buy my first suit in Durban. <laughs> so we worked together a little when I was at the University of Natal in 1992 when I first came to South Africa to work, and I remember Jerry very well. So Jerry, as we all affectionately know him, was uh, born in Durban, and he was born of parents who had themselves uh, been born of grandparents who came to Cape Town, uh, to South Africa in the second wave of immigration uh, into South Africa from India. He enrolled briefly at the, at the medical school at the University of Natal when apartheid segregation was in full force and he left for those political reasons and completed his medical degree at the University <coughs> of Bombay. After returning to South Africa, he acquired several other degrees, a Master's in Immunology, an MD from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, and an Honorary Doctorate from the University of Durban Westport. He became Professor of Pediatrics and Child Health at the University of Natal in 1990 and held that position for over 10 years and that was when I was at the university, and he ran a very strong and vibrant department which was highly regarded for its teaching, clinical excellence, and research. After retiring from that position, Jerry was appointed the Victor Dates Chair in HIV AIDS Research and Director of Biomedical Science at the Center for HIV AIDS Networking, IVAN, at the Nelson Mandela School of Medicine. He also held the position of scientific director of the Doris Duke Medical Research Institute at the Nelson Mandela School. He's currently uh, the director of MATCH, the Maternal, Adolescent, and Child Health Unit at the University of Fitz, although he tells me now the Durban uh, version of this is separate from this, and he's also Emeritus Professor of Pediatrics and Child Health at UKZN. He's made a very substantial contribution to pediatrics and child health. He's published, and I knew him first through his work on the management of malnutrition in children, but he's published also on the epidemiology, prevention, and contextual factors factors influencing many children's uh, diseases. The Lancet once described him, quote, as an icon of South African health who broke through the barriers of racist rule to establish himself as a top pediatrician 
and then an international authority on HIV AIDS, especially mother-to-child transmission. And in that regard, Jerry stood out very strongly, um, together with some of us, but we were really followers, in insisting that uh, infant feeding in the context of HIV should change from what it was at the time when many studies showed that mi mixed feeding was the worst of both worlds. His political and social ac activity has also been immense. When he was in India, in Bombay, he formed the South African Students Association, which engaged with the leaders of newly independent India, as well as leaders of the ANC. Jerry was a prominent member of the UDF, and also on the executive of NAMDA, and I think one of the founder members of the National Medical and Dental Association, which was set up in opposition to MASA at the time. He has held a number of key roles in national and international policy initiatives. He was chairperson of the Maternal and Child Health Committee uh, under the ANC, responsible for developing the first democratic national health policy. He chaired the Expert International Commission, convened by UNAIDS and the International AIDS Society. <laughs> And he was a commissioner with the National Planning Commission in South Africa from 2010 to 2015, guiding the development of the National Development Plan. He's been honored by late President Mandela with the Star of South Africa for his contribution to democracy and health. And he received the International Association of Physicians in AIDS and Care Award the Heroes in Medicine Award in Toronto, Canada, and the Nelson Mandela Award for Health and Human Rights. His research record is quite astounding. He has published over 350 papers in peer-reviewed journals, and many of them in leading journals, uh, and many, many chapters as well as a well-known uh, textbook on pediatrics and child health. He has been awarded the Order of the Star of South Africa and the Science for Society Gold Medal from the Academy of Science in South Africa. He's an honorary fellow of the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene and one of a handful of South Africans who is a foreign member of the Institute of Medicine in the USA. Uh, we've talked a little bit about his family. I know his wife. Uh, but his son is a professor at UCT and a fairly well-known author of novels, which some of you may have read. And his daughter works in the field of health economics. So, Jerry, it really is wonderful. We're very, very pleased, and I personally am very flattered that you accepted our invitation, and we look forward to your talk. I've been speaking to him, and I must say that I'm so impressed by what he's achieved over 
that this School of Public Health is a unique institution in this country. I'm a great admirer of uh, Amartya Sen, and he, he says repeatedly that great countries are built by great institutions and the people who work and do research in them. And I think this School of Public Health, of all the ones I've seen, is a uniquely admirable institution. So I think much of the uh, much of the praise goes to David for achieving that. And I'm so happy that you are here to take part in what he has to teach because he's got tons to teach. Uh, he's got an experience which I can never hope to equal. And um, I'd like to speak about things which I think are important to him. We shared a lot in common. And one of the things we shared, not his suits, but we certainly shared a love for health in the most broadest sense. So that's what I want to speak to you about within the South African context. The title is, I was chairperson of the International AIDS Conference in 2000. And this was our logo then. And it was called, what, uh, Bridging the Gap or Mind the Gap. And it referred to the, to the gap between theory, practice, and drugs, and treatment, and so on. You might remember at that time, we had a terrible argument with the government of Thabo and Becky, who didn't believe in drugs and science and uh, who came up with peculiar ideas of what the causation of AIDS was. So that was a gap that needed to be bridged. In this case, I, I've got a particular, not predilection, but I have a, a real a feeling for the gap between private medicine and public medicine. And anyone who lives in KwaZulu and Natal will understand why. Our public services are deplorable absolutely deplorable. And when I hear what's happened for people who got cancer in, in Durban, you will weep. You will absolutely weep. I saw a TV program where there was a harassed husband who couldn't get treatment in the public sector, was too poor to afford private care, and watched his wife dying because she, <coughs> because she couldn't get chemotherapy. So when I, when you, when I talk about that, that's the background. I've also worked in the Western Cape for a while. I had a research project in the in the Eden District with a couple of the UCT people. So I know a fair amount of this place too. And I must tell you that you are you are specially advantaged by being in this province and being in these uh, medical institutions here because they're hard to replicate anywhere else in the country. Oh, so let me, that was an introduction. I would also like it if you don't repeat my full Islamic name. It's not necessary. I, first of all, I'm not a very holy Muslim or so, but uh, I'm stuck with the names I've got. <laughs> the, the nickname I got, you won't believe, is a heritage of the past. I mean, for some reason, white people found it difficult to pronounce Hussein, which is a fairly easy name. So they gave me this strange uh, name, and I've been stuck with it. And I know if I went back to my real name, nobody would recognize me. So I apologize for you having to say my full name with the middle name, etc. I'm going to speak to you about uh, trying to achieve equity in health. And once again, I'm concentrating on the division between public and private. And you, I don't need to tell you that the public sector is in a real dilemma. The quality of Public health is atrocious. The quantity of public health, that means coverage, is poor. And so that's where my particular emphasis is. There are a lot of other things to talk about, but I want to concentrate on that. And because I've been involved in the struggle for freedom for a long time, I want to do it within the broader context of what I see going on around in the world. And it's, it's really astonishing what's happening these days. I used to belong to what I thought was the left, and uh, I don't know anymore. I don't know because if you ask people, the old um, verities about left and right have almost disappeared in most parts of the world, especially in the Western world. So we are now stuck with not just being the left, but being identity seekers to some extent, being uh, parochial, being other things than left and right. So I still am 
con convinced that the left and the left vision of society, of institutions, of healthcare is the only valid one. And it may arise from the fact that I worked for about three months in private practice. I only went into private practice because my father, being an Indian businessman, <laughs> thought that I was in university because I was a lousy doctor. He said, why don't you go out and make money? So I tried for three months. It was a total disaster. And I've never recovered from that, and I've never <laughs> gone into private practice ever again. So that, that's a background to what I'm going to say. The first thing I want to say is, um, I, I know what, I knew your ex-vice chancellor. Not very well, but in passing I knew him. And this, this, I remember his, this is his inaugural statement, right? And Jake's always believed and said, and I never understood why, that was, this was going to be the university of the left. I didn't exactly know what he meant by that. Universities are really difficult creatures to move, and to move something to the left is especially difficult in this country, where there are very conservative elements running most of our university. But Jakes was an exception, and he was an exception because he believed what I think most vice chancellors don't really, or haven't internally internal, internal, internalized. And that is that any university is a reflection what goes on in society. All the organized elements in society are reflected in a university. He thought, and I don't know anything about Afrikaans University. I never worked there. I can't speak the language because I grew up in an English environment. They taught, taught me Latin, which I've forgotten completely. But he thought that Afrikaans universities reflected the Afrikaans culture, which meant the Nationalist Party culture at that time. I think he's right. He could have finished up by saying that the English universities don't know exactly what they are, but they ref reflect partly English liberalism where at the, in the basic, but occasionally not so. UK ZN, where I come from, we fought lots of battles, but always within the context of the ANC-led liberation movement. We had people like Biko, who was black consciousness and others, but it was a highly politicized environment, and that's what we fought for, and that's what I reflect. So the next point I want to make is this business about public and private health care. And I want to give you the rationale as I understand it. It's very well to rave and rant at the private sector, but exactly what is it about the private sector that makes it uh, inapplicable to this country and to me? So there's a book I've read which has influenced me a lot. And because I know the Cape Town population is a bit more literate than Durban, and most of the people here might have read it. It's called uh, A Brief History of Human Beings, and it's written by this guy called Harari, and it's an absolute eye opener. But what he points out, and I want to go through the details, uh, it's a phenomenally good book with really wonderful and new things revealed on every page. But what he said, is that uh, uh, prior to about the, uh, 12,000 BC, uh, there were foragers when people walked around uh, <coughs> collecting seeds or fruit and occasionally slaughtering an animal. Those, they were foragers and there was no difference between people. They worked as a group. However, once agriculture was discovered, once people realized they could plant seeds or grow, um, nurture animals, then it became a position of owning that particular territory. And that was the first example of what private ownership and private concerns meant. And they go all the way from then to now. Of course, the Industrial Revolution and uh, those sorts of events exacerbated private practice and private ownership. But that was the beginning to me from, of what is private ownership and it has led to many, many difficult things. He, he also mentions another fact. When you had foragers, they were in large groups of people, but when, you, when the uh, agricultural revolution came, you had about millions of people at such a certain stage, but they had to be coerced to cooperate. They didn't do it naturally. You might believe we do, but we, they didn't do it, and we don't do it naturally. And he thought that some things had to be created. He called them myths. Some myths had to be created 
to convince people that they must uh, believe in, in, in some centralizing force. So in our country, it's this myth that, well, uh, coming from the Freedom Charter, the country belongs to all who, who live in it. You and I know it's not true, because every day we're reminded of, well, if you live in KwaZulu-Natal, you know what I mean. But we are not uh, a United Nation in that. If you look at the US, what's the words? Uh, we express these words to be true or evident. And all, is it all men? I don't think you forgot about women. All men, all men are born equal. You'd have to be absolutely nuts to believe that about the US. Men are not equal, women are not equal, races are not equal, nothing is equal. But still, that myth acts as a centralizing force, and that's what uh, brought people together, and that's what happened at that time, too. The next point I wanted to make is that it's here, and is that this is a graph to show you about what I'm going to speak about a lot, that's money, wealth, and health services, and health effects. So this diagram shows you on the vertical, on that side, survival, survival, or life expectancy, and on the lower, the x-axis, it shows you the amount of money spent on health care. And you'll see there's this graph which has sort of what's it, parabolic curve. But on the right, which I haven't labeled, is the United States, right on top, on the right. So you can see the U.S. spends a ton of money and they get a fair amount of returns. But I know it's anathema to many South African right-wingers and, and absolute anathema to the U.S. But Cuba, look at Cuba. Cuba spends very little and yet they get the same returns in terms of survival. So when many people ask us, asked Mandela, why do you people support Cuba? It's a, uh, what? They talk about human rights. It's a joke. Cuba's got great human rights, and I thought the U.S. would be the last person, country in the world after Guantanamo, after Iraq, after the current attack, after, what's his name, uh, Trump, etc., to talk about human rights and say that uh, Cuba isn't, it's just it's bizarre. But anyway, the point is that if you, you don't have to spend tons of money. If you spend money wisely, efficiently, it can be very effective and you can get the same survival rate. Here's South Africa on the right. We are far from efficient, we are far from effective, and I'll show you in a minute or two why we are not. But we are not. Basically, we spend a lot of money and we get very little in return. And I'm not just talking about race. The, the next slide is just a reminder to me that uh, one of the big things in, this, uh, in the world at this moment is the de degree of um, centralization of wealth. And this is one from the, I think it's from the, the Oxfam briefing paper, and it shows you that 1% of the population in the world, 1%, owns more than 99% of the rest of the world. I mean, that is just like unimaginable, unimaginable, 1%. I mean, I think we have about 7 billion, you count 1% owns more than, in terms of wealth, more than 99%. Uh, and there are many other examples, I'm not going to bore you with that, because you'd have to be walking around blindfolded if you didn't know that our country is one of the most unequal in the world, by some definition, that's the Gini coefficient and others. But it is true, there are many in unequal inequalities in this country, and that they affect health also. The next slide shows you some of these inequalities and where we stand. So this is, what's the share of the total wealth for the top 10%, top 10 days? And you'll see that these countries, which are much more fairer than others, that means a smaller proportion owns the top 10%, are places like Australia and Belgium, Canada, etc. And the worst are those countries which have about 70% of the wealth in the hands of a few people. And it shows you that we are one of them. We are 71.7% of the total wealth is owned by a small group of people. There's a further example. The next, the next slide 
shows you that we are, we are in the midst of, I told you, first of all, there's all these political changes. There's no left or right anymore. It's identity politics. It's cultural appropriation, etc. But in addition to that, there are a couple of transmission, transitions which we are undergoing. We know the demographic uh, transition in the 18th to 20th century. They have discovered sanitation, they discovered cleanliness, and it prevented premature death. So that was the demographic transition. The next one you're even more familiar with is the epidemiological transition. We shifted towards away from infectious diseases as a major killer to non-infectious diseases. That is still going on, but there's been a major shift in the health system transformation which concerns me most and should concern you too, is the shift in the type of health system we got, which works towards more towards equity than inequity. So that's a, those are the major shifts. And then if you read current literature, you'll find that there's a vision for the future, which in, includes the proper and more detailed use of technology. I'm sure all of you have read about artificial intelligence, the big data, and so on. So that's the future, but that hasn't happened sufficiently widely. This is, uh, this is the first major point about this country. <coughs> the first major point is the inequities. And you'll see again that on the left there is um, the, pool, the pool of uh, funds, pool of funds for the public sector, pool of funds for the private sector, and in, the, in, bet, in between is, uh, it's what you spend by cash. But the most important thing are, this, these, are these here. You'll see that the private sector and the public sector have roughly the same amount of money, about 4.2% of GDP. And it's 44% of funds for the private sector, 44% or near 43% for the public sector. But the, so they get the same amount of money, same amount of money. But look at the difference in the populations we serve. We meaning a public, I'm a public health person. We look after, sorry, 